few years ago, I came across an address given by Carl Palmack, who uh, previously was the, dir the director of music at the Boston Conservatory. And uh, it's an amazing uh, speech address that he gave to the students. He also gave it to parents of freshmen. So uh, I just love this so much. And he talks about 9-11 uh, uh, and, um, and the experience he had. He was living in uh, New York. He was in Manhattan. And just the, what, what they all went through those, those first few days and weeks. And um, I guess, it, I mean, we watched it all. We all watched it on the news. But it was interesting to read his... Uh, Address. So let me just quote him. The first organized public event that I remember was the Brahms Requiem. The first organized public expression of grief, our first communal response to that historic event, was a concert. And then he goes on and says this. Again, I'm quoting. Music is one of the ways we make sense of our lives. One of the ways in which we express feelings when we have no words, a way for us to understand things with our hearts when we can't with our minds. And then later on in this wonderful address to students and parents, he says this, and this is very key. If we were a medical school and you were here as a med student practicing appendectomies, you would take your work very seriously because you would imagine that some night at 2 a.m. someone is going to waltz into your emergency room and you're going to have to save their life. Well, my friends, someday at 8 p.m. someone is going to walk into your concert hall and bring you a mind that is confused, a heart that is overwhelmed, a soul that is weary. Whether they go out whole again will depend partly on how well you do your craft. I love this um, quote of Karl Palmack because it, it, it helps me. It, it puts things in perspective and helps me keep it there, realizing what what uh why i'm doing this um so vision is very important and we're going to segue into confidence in a minute but let me read a couple of other uh quotes i love this um quote by sherry do she spoke at the byu women's conference in 1998 and she said this I couldn't have been more than 10 or 11 when my mother gave me a stack of classical albums, introducing me to some of the great composers whose works were characterized by dramatic musical passages and what I call the big finish. I would lie in front of the stereo for hours, listening to the third movement of Rachmaninoff's second piano concerto or his prelude in C-sharp minor, all the while imagining myself at a shiny black concert grand in Carnegie Hall. I pictured my debut there, standing ovation and all. I imagined that I would be humble br but brilliant, brilliant enough to move an entire audience, including mother, to tears. Somewhere in all of my daydreaming, I caught a vision of how it would feel to play so beautifully that others' hearts would soar. And then she continues, again, I'm quoting, at that point, mother no longer had to encourage me to practice. Once I had the vision of the possibilities, the motivation to master the piano came from inside. Am I saying that practicing suddenly was enjoyable? Absolutely not. It was often sheer drudgery. But I found a technique that helped me endure those tedious hours of practice day in and day out. When I set out to tackle a new piece, 
I would master and memorize the big finish first, all the while visualizing myself in concert where the audience jumped to its feet at the last chord. Imagining how grand the big finish would be kept me going through months of rehearsals on technical passages that didn't provide nearly the same sense of drama, but that had to be mastered nonetheless. In short, my progress on the piano and my motivation to practice increased dramatically when I caught a vision of my potential." End quote. I, I love this because the vision of what we want to do and accomplish is so important, uh, whether we are a student, whether we are a teacher, a performer, and the list goes on. When I was preparing to perform my senior recital at Brigham Young University, I uh, was going through some different health challenges which have continued through to this day, but I, I got really discouraged. And um, I, had, I had a book in my very small library back then. Um, it's entitled With Your Own Two Hands and it is written, the author is Seymour Bernstein. And he's just awesome. And I've had the opportunity to meet him and this book, the perspective that he takes us through as far as practicing and performing and nerves and techni technical things is amazing. And I would pull out that book every single day before, during, and after my practice sessions. And this book and reading it and internalizing many of its concepts really helped me keep my focus. And so uh, I love this. And in, in a chapter, let me find it, chapter 11 in this book, by, uh, With Your Own Two Hands, Seymour Bernstein says this, one summer toward the end of his career, the late cellist Gregor Piatigorsky was scheduled to give a solo recital at the Tanglewood Festival in Massachusetts. Several of his students, unable to find seats in the sold-out auditorium, were given permission to listen to the concert backstage. There, they witnessed their master, a lifetime of brilliant performances behind him, pace nervously back and forth. Finally, the moment arrived. The auditorium was darkened, the stage lights were slowly raised to full intensity and all was in expectancy. Suddenly, as though unable to contain his anguish one second longer, the guest artist stopped his pacing, turned toward his students and exclaimed, there are no heroes a moment before a recital. Whereupon he set his jaw, lifted his cello into the air like a scepter and charged onto the stage amidst thunderous applause. In his playing, he was the hero he could not be backstage. I love that because it, it uh, I think we all go through that prior to a performance, prior to giving a presentation, prior to a class, on and on. We prepare and uh, don't feel like a hero, certainly beforehand. And then we, we go out and lift our head high and uh, share with our audiences. So... I love that. That's uh, one of my favorites. So let's talk for a minute. Um, we have in the past, almost we're going on two years, but year and a half, uh, we've all, every single one of us living on the face of the earth, uh, we're enduring this global COVID-19 pandemic. And uh, one of the things we found out very early on was the absolute importance of the arts. And of course, as a musician, I, I learned that, that, that so many were just starving for the connection to music and the arts. Um, I received messages after messages from various people who just were missing concerts and uh, many of us began posting 
small little performances of various types of music and uh, so many people were grateful. I came across uh, an article and we all had heard early on in the pandemic, we heard about Italy really suffered. They were in complete lockdown and um, we heard, and I saw this on, on the news, we saw it on social media where people would be out in their balconies and they would be singing and there was professionals playing from the balcony and and i i didn't uh i i just saw little clips here and there and thought how wonderful and and uh, that that people were sharing across the way and across their balconies but i came across this uh, article written by let's see if i can say his name aldo Chikini, who is a violinist, and um, he's uh, part of the radio television, the Italian radio television orchestra in Milan. And uh, there's an article that um, was posted in April 2020 in the United Nations News. And he says this. Um, he, he, actually, he was involved in a project at La Scala, the great uh, opera theater, and he said this, everyone stopped, opera, cinema, theater, everything. We are all worried about this. And again, this is April 2020, because it's difficult to think about our work as it was before. And then he goes on, and I just love this. He said, in March, which would have been March 2020, one of my colleagues in the orchestra at La Scala called on every musician in Italy to open their window or to go to the balcony to perform at 6 in the afternoon. The first time I took part, it was a very cold evening. It was strange because most of the neighbors didn't know that I played the violin. When I started playing, I felt quite shy, but after a couple of minutes, I could see people happy and smiling. Then after I had finished the piece, they were clapping, shouting, and demanding more. I carried on playing, and they wanted more and more, so I told them, if you want this, let's do it again tomorrow at the same time. That was the beginning of everything. I love I love this. I, I I can you imagine? There they were all in lockdown in their uh, homes and apartments, and they emerge on their balconies and are are blessed by hearing this wonderful violinist. Now back to uh, Aldo Cicchini's, um article quote. From then on, I played many famous pieces from different countries, such as mu music from the movie Cinema Paradiso, or Claire de Lune by Debussy, or Carlos Gardel's Por Una Cabeza, and Imagine by John Lennon. Although the acoustics are not great on the balcony, the music is bringing people closer together during this time of isolation. It is not a cure for the disease, but it is maybe a cure for our hearts. Let me say that again. Music is not a cure for the disease, but it is maybe a cure for our hearts. 